Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good? Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming to Palo Alto. It's a beautiful day. And um, I'm uh, going to be telling you, OK, my presentation works. It's up there. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about how I took a concept from science and translated that into, a, into an actual product. That's a really hard thing to do. Now, uh, who here, I just want to get a show of hands, who here has a business that's in transformative technology? Raise your hands. Who has a business here? OK, so like 50% or something like that. OK, who here doesn't have a business but would like to have one? that's in this space, okay. Maybe like 20% or something. Okay, who here doesn't have a business, doesn't want to start a business, and is perfectly happy with that? Raise your hands. Okay, these are the smart people in the room. <laughs> okay, uh, business is very tough, um, but at the heart of it, it's a, a spiritual journey. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I will have persuaded maybe some of you to, uh, maybe get into the transformative technology venture. Um, so I have been in this transformative technology space for about uh, a decade, actually. Started when I was 18. Um, and so over the, over the 10 years that I've been doing this, I've, uh, oh, don't, that's not gonna work up there. All right. Um, so over the, the decade that I've been doing this, I've seen myself uh, having two businesses that I walked away from. At 18, I didn't really know what I was doing. Went to college, ended up dropping out of college, going to Germany, working on a documentary f uh, that was completely funded and fueled by Bitcoins, um, finding myself in the hacks program. Uh, 10 days after landing in Hawaii from a trip in Helsinki, uh, and working 14-hour days in an office skyscraper in Shenzhen, China on an ultrasound device. So needless to say, it's, it's a, been a wild ride. Uh, but it really is, for me, a very spiritual journey. Um, sorry, is this thing working? I don't. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, we could just. Yeah. Is that it? Sorry. <laughs> Could you just click through? Just go to the first slide with words on it, I guess. Let's say. That'd be cool. <laughs> uh, that background is a photo I took in uh, Japan, actually, while I was in China. OK. Getting back to it. All right, so in order for you to succeed in business, you have to change the questions that you're asking. At the heart of it, you need to realize that if you keep on asking the same questions, you're always going to get the same answers. So if you change the questions that you're asking, you're going to be getting different answers. So in order for you to succeed, what you need to do is realize that your product ain't shit. And the customer, the people that you're serving, are way more important than whatever product you've made. And when I made that realization, it was huge. So fall in love with your customers, not your product. Because your product, in, especially in this space, in one, two, three years, is going to be completely irrelevant. Somebody will, cop will have copied you in, from China. Somebody will co come up with something even cooler. So you need to be able to stay ahead of that. Now, if you want to succeed, you need really good customers. And the way you do that is by meeting their needs better than anyone else in the market. So the best way to do that is to recognize what are the human needs that people need. Uh, can you go to the? OK, so there are six primary human needs that people meet in business and consumer products. First one is certainty. Can this device provide some manner of certainty, some comfort? Then there's variety. Is there something fun, different about it? Uh, is there significance that I get from using the device? iPhones are you know, a good example. Uh, can I get love or connection? Can I connect with other people? Can I grow as a human? And can I contribute back to the world? Now, if you can make a product that can meet three 
of those needs, then you will have a, a product that is habit forming, that will actually be sort of addictive to the user. And therefore, you'll have customers that will last for a lifetime. Uh, next. Um, so, yeah. All right, so anyway, um, the other thing you need to realize is that you need to um, always, always realize that your, your time is a resource that you have a lot of. And in the beginning, you have limited money. So if you want to really be irresistible to your customers, you want to make them an irresistible offer. How do you do that? Well, if you come up to somebody and you say, hey, I have this cool HRV device or I have a EEG device, it's, it's pretty cool, I would love for you to purchase it. It's going to help you uh, stay calm and do, do well at your, at your work. Right? So that's a pretty OK pitch. But if you want to make it irresistible, what if you said something like, I have a product that will transform your life so much that I guarantee within 30 days you'll be 10% uh, more productive at work, you'll have much better interactions with people, and if you don't find that to be the case, I will refund your, your money completely, 100%. No questions asked. So that's an, that's an offer you can make to somebody. It costs you, costs you absolutely nothing to make the offer. It's irresistible. And it's seemingly deceptive in the, in the, in the, wa in the way that um, it's, uh, people think, I don't want to make an offer like that because then I'll be paying people back. But it actually shows confidence in the product. You'll actually sell more that way. So, um, uh, and then going on to questions, you want to ask yourself, what business am I in first? So you want to say, like, am I in the business of EEG or HRV or brain stimulation, and then realize that that's actually probably not the business that you're actually in. Uh, you want to ask yourself, what business are you really in? Uh, so what business you're really in is a question that comes from Steve Jobs. And he started asking himself that when he came back to Apple in 1997. And people started saying, OK, we're in the business of making really cool products. And he's like, OK, I, I like that, but is there something more that we're not seeing. And the, the answer that he really liked was, we're in the business of connecting people to their passions. That was one that he really liked. And he thought to himself, like, what are some passions that people have? And OK, Steve Jobs, if you know him, big fan of music. Right? So he started playing with that idea for many years. And how can we connect people to the music passion? And there came iTunes. One of the most, it really is the most successful music streaming business in the world, right? And it still, still will be for a long time. Apple Computers was the name of the company in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. They dropped that. Now they're Apple. If they had just stayed in a computer business, they would have been in, they have 13% of their revenue comes from computers. Like about 50% comes from uh, consumables like music and movies. So. It's a really key thing to ask yourself. Those questions are key. Now, uh, next slide. Um, you can ask yourself the third one of these questions is what business do I need to be in? And so Steve Jobs asking himself what business do I need to be in was like, OK, well, not the computer business, but in the music business or the streaming online business. Very successful. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room could really benefit from re-examining what business they're actually in. Um, and so I did that for my company. Uh, next slide. So what I came up with was that I'm in the business of providing technology to geniuses to help them find scientific break breakthroughs in record time. Um, and that's, that encompasses brain stimulation, which is what Jade just talked about. But uh, the business that I need and want to be in is actually in creating the geniuses themselves. So brain stimulation is a way to uh, tap into the deepest parts of the brain that make us function. And what makes us really work are the different lobes of our brain. And 
uh, area of uh, chief interest for me is the cerebellum, which is found at the base of your skull. Uh, it's probably the, one of the first evolutionary things that we developed as a way of problem solving. And there's these amazing uh, cells in there. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of these slides real quick. So, um, so this is a microtubule. And if you follow Stuart Hamroff, uh, he'll talk about these a lot, uh, almost to a fault. But uh, it's great. It's, it's a really cool, um, kind of un misunderstood part of the cytoskeleton that makes cells work. Um, and in, the, in a cell, if you look like a paramecium, in order for them to get around without a central computer brain, they'll actually use, utilize their cytoskeleton, which are those microtubules in lattice structures that surround it, and they communicate with each other, and they can actually reach out. Uh, we'll look at the next slide. So they actually act like that. They behave, they shoot out neurons. And if you go to the next slide, we'll see what a, a neuron in the brain looks like. This is actually the same concept of a just a regular cell that's been able to shoot an arm out and communicate with other neurons. Now, how do they do that? Well, if we look at uh, the common uh, conception for how a neuron communicates, um, is through sy uh, synapses. And they think that like, you, know, you, you send like a chemical and it uh, goes to another synapse, and, and then you have membrane potentials and like electricity firing on the uh, skin of the neuron. But actually, the, the microtubules are likely a, another carrier of signals. And they're not just like discrete, quantized units of electricity. They're actually ways to transfer uh, frequencies throughout the entire brain. Uh, really look into what these things do. The microtubules are really amazing structure. It looks like a carbon nanotube. And it can actually take uh, information and calculate the information as it's sending it to a de destination. Uh, next one. And so if you want to get connections between neurons without a synapse, you can look at gap junctions where the fingers connect. And there are little windows where these microtubules can actually see each other. And they can basically uh, read each other through uh, vibrations, similar vibrations to what ultrasound is doing. Um, and they might even be thinking of uh, apples or cherries at the same time. So next one. Um, and so if you look at the cerebellum, this is a Purkinje cell. It's got about 1,000 of these dendrites. They all uh, integrate information. They calculate it. This is actually part of a tensor network, which is where Google gets the name TensorFlow for their deep uh, learning algorithms. And I think they're trying to recreate a cerebellum, basically. Uh, each, each dendrite is weighted for different values, and it calculates things. This is where you have problem solving. So next, um, so how could we potentially get into this area uh, was an idea that I heard from Elon Musk, which is a neural lace. And instead of just doing deep brain stimulation where we throw a bunch of electrodes in your head, which is really a bad thing to do, uh, there's al already a big pathway to get through the head. And it's the, uh, the capillary network. It's the blood network. Um, so that's the blood-brain barrier that separates the blood from the neuron area. So next one. Um, so if we wanted to go into uh, a, a cell, or into a capillary, what we would want to do is go to an area where the astrocytes are. Those are like little uh, neurons that control the vasculature. And if you're in an area like that, then you're close to a neuron. Those actually control the blood flow and give glucose to the surrounding neurons. So you could, if you could find a way to get in there, next slide, uh, then you would find a capillary somewhere in your throat down by your collarbone, in, inject a uh, you know, microcontroller and a neuron. Next one, you'd go through an endothelial cell. You would route it up there. Ultrasound has a way of uh, being like a carrot in a way of uh, guiding the tendrils of a, an axon. Uh, next one. Uh, and then when you get to the destination, when you find the astrocyte or the brain activity somewhere deep in the cerebellum, you could have about a thousand of these in one area. Then you can exit through an endothelial cell, which will uh, reheal itself, and then you can do gap junction connections to the surrounding neurons. And then, then therefore, you have a uh, biocompatible neural lace that your body isn't going to really recognize as anything other than itself. Uh, and then you have in and out connections, and next one. Um, and then on the other end, you would have something like a, like a basically a little microcontroller, a cell phone, 
probably behind your collarbone, uh, really simply there. And uh, you could have it wireless. You'd basically be able to connect with an artificially intelligent computer and uh, be a genius. So next one. Uh, this would provide enhanced memory, learning, and problem solving. Very simple. Uh, next one. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much. That's where I got from asking these different kinds of questions. Um, I'd love to uh, have you follow me uh, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and talk to me afterwards. So uh, thank you all so much. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you.